Under my power, look into the hypnotic eye. Time now to enter Mr. Lobo's domain. Look out! Open your mind to the possibility that they're not bad movies, just misunderstood. You're not dreaming. You're watching cinema in Sophie. The facts presented in tonight's feature are true. Everything else, of course, is not. I'm Mr. Lobo. I didn't want to believe that Peter, killers from space, Graves would make tonight's feature until I was presented with the overwhelming physical evidence. Your mission tonight, should you accept it, is to suspend your disbelief, skepticism, critical thinking, common sense, sour stomach, abdominal cramps, headache, uh, nagging cough, or other symptoms of disbelief. That's what I intend to do. As Mr. Lobo opens his mind and closes his nostrils for the biography of the Grandfather of Grunge. He goes by many names. Sasquatch, the Noxy Monster, the Swamp Ape, the Skunk Ape, the Momo Giant, uh, St. Nicholas, Chewbacca, Andre the Giant, Chaka Khan, Grizzly Adams, and Shaquille O'Neal. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we present to you now reel one of the Exhibit E, true Hollywood story of Bigfoot, the mysterious monster. The motion picture you're about to see was filmed by many teams of cameramen in more than a hundred locations around the globe. Scientists representing the world's foremost research centers took part in the examination of the evidence. The facts that will be presented are true. This may be the most startling film you'll ever see. Here in this forest, investigators have discovered a set of very strange footprints. Human-like footprints, about 18 inches long and 7 inches wide. The footprints of a giant. A mysterious creature is roaming this wilderness. A creature that has confounded scientists, baffled investigators, and captured the imagination of millions of people. We've all heard of the reported sightings of this creature, a creature most of us know as Bigfoot. We've read about it in our newspapers and heard about it on radio and television. 
And some of you, like me, might have been skeptical about these reports, wondering how it could be possible for a sizable population of eight-foot, 500-pound monsters to live among us on the edge of our industrialized society. Well, I was skeptical, but I was also tantalized by what I heard. So I decided to find out for myself whether Bigfoot was fact or fiction. I did this by going out to talk to the eyewitnesses, questioning scientists, by examining the footprints, by looking at and listening to all of the available evidence. What I found out, I will now show you. A body of evidence difficult to ignore. First, there's the fact that this phenomenon is nationwide. That each year, people of all kinds from many places report seeing the giant creature, describing it as being covered with hair, being half man, half ape, and as having an overwhelming stench. In the last decade alone, there have been over 300 reported sightings of Bigfoot in America. It's called by different names in different parts of the country, like Momo, or the Falk Monster, or the Skunk Ape, or Sasquatch, or the Noxie Monster. But whatever they call it, the people who see it are all describing the same thing. I felt something staring at me, or a feeling of being watched. And I turned around, and that's when I saw Bigfoot. Oh, I was in, I was in shock. Uh, the totally unexpected and in the only equation I could make on this thing is that it was a gorilla. In spite of such eyewitness testimony, there are scientists who say that creatures like Bigfoot do not exist. That such monsters dwell only in our minds, not in our forests. They point out that man has always been quick to believe in monsters, and that these beliefs are born out of the unknown and nurtured by the unexplained. But even these scientists agree that some monsters have had a basis in fact. For centuries, Western man had heard rumors about a legendary man monster that roamed the jungles of darkest Africa. It wasn't until the late 19th century that science caught up with this legendary monster, calling it the gorilla. New species are in fact being discovered and classified each year. New mammals, reptiles, fish, birds, and thousands of new insects. As Mr. Graves pointed out in tonight's movie, we classify over 10 million new animals each year that were previously completely unknown to science. Why, in fact, the canis, or dog, was believed to be completely imaginary and was only officially recognized in 1961. Science can be so slow to recognize new discoveries. Oh, look, look over there. It's an entirely new species of, of mammaloid. I think I'll name him uh, Diphnocorflopolithopus. Cinema Insomnia, but we'll be right back with more of Bigfoot, Mystery or Mud Wrestler, after these yet to be classified bipedal hominids. <laughs> is the legendary Bigfoot, one of the most awesome trucks ever built by man. Bigfoot goes anywhere, does anything. And now it's coming right at you, your very own Bigfoot. You add batteries, turn on the key, forward shift, reverse, four-wheel drive for power, two-wheel drive for speed, lights, action, the works. Go, Bigfoot, go. Bigfoot 4x4x4 from Play School. I want to report something in my house. A big something. The Hendersons have an unusual house guest. It just ate our goldfish. And where is it now, Mr. Henderson? It's in the bathroom. He wasn't invited, but he's not an intruder. Just give me one week. George, we don't have enough house for two days. He doesn't fit here. See, there was this, this giant... Is there a beanstalk involved in this, Mr. Henderson? He's not really a friend, but he's becoming part of the family. Boy, this guy's strong! What is that smell? Once Irene sees it, the whole world's gonna know. Everybody just act normal. Some call him human, others call him animal, but the Hendersons call him Harry. 
Harry and the Hendersons. I think he likes it here. When two inexplicable events occur simultaneously, it is scientifically sound and prudent to pay very, very close attention. So obviously it would be irrelevant and a complete and utter waste of time to even begin to try to tell you the story of Bigfoot without traveling halfway around the world to explain yet another unexplainable creature. For many miles away, something crawls through the slime at the bottom of a dark Scottish lock, many miles away, many miles away. Like the creatures that dwell in Loch Ness, a mysterious lake in the highlands of Scotland. Here in these waters dwells a family of monsters that some scientists believe are survivors from the age of the dinosaurs. The Loch Ness Monster has been reported seen by thousands of people, by tourists, and by the villagers who live around the lake. And yet for years, the scientific establishment has denied the possibility of the monster's existence. Denied it even though its history goes back to the year 565, when a saintly monk first wrote about his encounter with the creature. Denied it even in the face of contemporary accounts, like that of the Reverend Father Brucey. We're standing on the jetty by the boathouse, just on the left there, and uh, looking across to the bay, we saw a sudden tremendous turmoil in the waters, and without being able to see anything, what was causing it. And suddenly we noticed this huge black head moving along, seven or eight feet out of the water, very, very slowly, coming towards some diagonal direction. And then after about 15 seconds, it went down. Well, we never saw any humps, but it was very exciting while it lasted. A creature like the one Father Brucey saw was photographed in 1934 by a vacationing London surgeon, Robert K. Wilson. But scientists rejected that photograph as evidence, as they did this one, taken in 1951 by Lachlan Stewart, a photograph which shows the mysterious humps that undulate on the creature's back. This picture, taken in 1955 by Peter McNabb, was similarly rejected even though it clearly shows the creature nearby a familiar landmark. There were at least 16 photographs of the Loch Ness Monster, and all of them were rejected as evidence by the scientific community. It wasn't until this man, Tim Dinsdale, took his motion picture film of the monster that some scientists began to take notice. Dinsdale, an aeronautical engineer, took this film with his 16 millimeter spring wind camera using a 135 millimeter telephoto lens. He submitted the film for analysis to the Joint Air Reconnaissance Intelligence Center at the British Defense Ministry. They enlarged the film as shown here, subjecting it to intense scrutiny. Their conclusions? That the film is of a living object, that it's moving 10 miles per hour, and that it's six feet wide and five feet high. Dinsdale's film of the creature encouraged a new breed of monster hunters. Starting in 1962, the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau brought a long-needed expertise into the search. They kept cameras pointed at all times on strategic parts of the lake. Their major achievement? This film, taken by Richard Rayner in June 1967. British Air Force scrutiny of this film led to the conclusion that, like the earlier Tim Dinsdale footage, this was a picture of a living object of some size. In 1969, for the first time, the monster hunters took their cameras underwater in submarines. But the unusually peaty and murky darkness of the lock's waters closed off all possible visibility. On at least two occasions, objects larger than 30 feet, like the Loch Ness Monster, have passed through the sonar beam. The computers then activated the strobe light and cameras, 
taking pictures every 10 seconds. In this way, the Ryan's team has collected the best evidence to prove the Loch Ness Monster's existence. The photographs are close-up dramatic pictures of a fin, about eight feet long and four feet wide. The fin of the Loch Ness Monster. Now that we know that it's there, what is it? Tim Densdale, who has interviewed almost every living eyewitness of the monster, has an idea. Then you get this tremendous body. The forward limbs, I think, are rather smaller than the rear ones. Uh, these curious humps, of which I think there are two, basically, at the pelvic and the shoulder girdle, and this region in between seems to be able to appear, uh, change shape. People have seen the back changing shape. They've actually watched it. And then up, right up the back end, you have, I think, a tremendous swimming tail, like a crocodile's tail, which is used to propel the thing through the water. Based on eyewitnesses' descriptions and the various photographs, suggests that the Loch Ness Monsters are a family of plesiosaurs, animals believed extinct for millions of years. As we learned with the coelacanth, extinct is not as final as it sounds. Some scientists now believe Loch Ness is home to 30 or 40 such giant creatures, creatures the local people refer to as Nessie, a harmless monster. Once rejected by scientists and skeptics, the Loch Ness monsters are now believed to live in this lake, 24 miles long, one mile wide. But still rejected by scientists and skeptics, are the giant monsters that dwell in the forests of North America. Mr. Lobo has become quite the shutterbug. I've just developed a few new snaps that have been examined, reviewed, and certified as things that are not plesiosaurs. Uh, a log is not a plesiosaur. Driftwood is not a plesiosaur. A bald guy sticking his arm out of the water is not a plesiosaur. An elbow is not a plesiosaur. A knee is not a plesiosaur. An otter, a gas can, and a discarded automotive tire are also things that are not plesiosaurs. Perhaps the reason that they've never actually found the Loch Ness Monster is because the entire bottom of the 24-mile-long lock is completely covered with uh, lens caps, uh, cameras, uh, little plastic film containers, telescopes, sonar equipment, kegs, bottles, martini olives, and the self-respect of thousands of bored rich men. Cinema Insomnia will be right back. For 1,400 years it has eluded man. Vague rumors, questionable evidence, all have led to dead ends in man's endless search for the monster. Until now, for as surely as you hear my voice, the Loch Ness Monster lives. Terrible in its power to drive man mad with fear. See for yourself when the Loch Ness Monster surfaces. At the Old Country Bush Gardens, Williamsburg. Some people call it a legend, others call it a lie. Is there a monster in the Loch Ness Bog? Or is Nessie just a horrible apparition swimming deep in the Scottish folklore? One man searches for science, another wants to pilfer for profit. But both find bloody horror. The beastie gets mad when the hunters get nosy. And any fool knows you don't want to make a monster mad. The Loch Ness Horror. Don't come looking for Nessie unless you're looking to die. Sea serpents, kimono dragons, pandas, diphtokerflopithecus. Clearly, all this adds up to Bigfoot. 
No doubts there. Now to fill in the gaps, let's get back with Peter Graves and tonight's classic Sun Shik Crockumentary, Bigfoot, Mammal or Mollusk. There's still an uncharted wilderness in America where unknown creatures could live. Hundreds of thousands of square miles unexplored by man, mapped only by aerial survey. A wilderness extensive enough to conceal a large population of hairy giants. Closer to home is the story of Ishii, the dawn man of Redding, California. This sole surviving member of an otherwise extinct tribe of American Indians, the Yahi, lived in the forests nearby Sacramento without modern man's knowing it. When he emerged out of his Stone Age isolation in 1912, he was living proof that creatures like the Bigfoot could live among us without our knowledge. And if Bigfoot is a species of man or ape that has survived a past age, then the turtle is proof that it could exist. A survivor from the age of the dinosaur, like certain lizards, some such creatures have remained unchanged for almost 200 million years. The crocodile is another reptile that has survived the ages. More proof that creatures from the past are alive today. There are even survivors of past ages that were once thought to be extinct, like the coelacanth, a species of fish scientists believed extinct for 60 million years, but found alive in the waters off South Africa in 1938. New legendary creatures are continually being found, like the Komodo dragon and the Okapi, both discovered only in this century. The giant panda was not discovered by Western scientists until 1937. It is still rarely seen in its natural habitat, the bamboo jungles in the mountains of China. This wilderness is shrinking. Civilization is narrowing its boundaries. And as it does, our contact with the Bigfoot creatures becomes more frequent. On the edge of the Oregon wilderness, in the Dalles, Bigfoot investigators have now opened an information center, not unlike what was done at Loch Ness to keep abreast of the increasing reports of such sightings. Um, what happened? Did you think, think you actually uh, saw something or heard something? Okay, did it look like a man? Was it, um, was it walking upright? Okay, how big do you think it was? Bigfoot, like the Loch Ness monster before it, is a creature that most people reject until they see it themselves. One skeptic was Mrs. Mary Jefferson a widow living alone in a small town in northern Washington. In late August 1973, she was distracted by the incessant barking of her dog. Emerging out of the wilderness, perhaps because of the recent forest fires to the north, came a creature Mrs. Jefferson had never seen before. team discovered giant footprints where Mrs. Jefferson said she saw the monster, providing supporting evidence to her testimony that Bigfoot had walked in her backyard. He was eight or ten feet tall, and he weighed seven or eight hundred pounds. Now, he walked upright like a man, and his hair, well, it was brownish, and it stood up on end. It was all tousled, and his face was just hideous, and he smelled... <laughs> The search for Bigfoot in the United States is in its infancy. The search for a relative of the Bigfoot has already been underway in Asia for over half a century. In the Caucasus and Pamir mountain ranges of Russia, scientists have found proof of a Bigfoot creature, which they call the Almista. In the nearby Himalayas, the highest mountains in the world, Western explorers and investigators have pursued the riddle of another elusive man-ape, the hairy giant known as the Abominable Snowman, or the Yeti. Part of the mountain people's lives for centuries 
The snowman only became known to the West in the late 19th century, when British mountaineers began to attempt to conquer Mount Everest. But it wasn't until 1951, when veteran climber Eric Shipton discovered a new pass at 19,000 feet, that actual evidence was collected. Shipton, standing where no man had ever been before, took these photographs of giant man-like tracks. Once a non-believer in the Yeti, Shipton remembers. Well, I must say I felt I had a very strange feeling inside. I've often seen these tracks before, but I, hitherto I'd always been a bit of an agnostic about the whole question, but seeing these tracks so absolutely fresh and clear, um, well, there seemed to be no doubt about it at all. And it was that that really gave me a very uh, eerie feeling that to hear one was in the presence of something quite unknown. Nicholas Tombazi of Athens, Greece, a photographer and a trained observer, had claimed he saw the abominable snowman on an expedition to Everest in 1925. Tombazi described it as a dark and hairy, man-like creature that was grubbing for roots with a stick. Other evidence to prove the snowman's existence has been collected. In 1958, one expedition discovered this cave, thought to be the lair of the Yeti. And in 1961, Another expedition came across what was believed to be the hide of a yeti. Another discovered what was believed to be a yeti's mummified hand. And what was said to be the hide of a yeti's skull. Yeti. Yeti. How 1971. You know, Mr. Lobo would hallucinate big furry things, too, if you were climbing up one of the world's highest mountains and not getting near enough oxygen to his brain. That absurd fairy story doesn't smack of credibility in my book, like Bigfoot does. It's amazing what people try to put over on intelligent, thinking television viewers. Which reminds me, Cinema Insomnia must break now uh, for these words from our sponsor. <laughs> Recently, an object was sighted. It was big! Bigger than big! Huge, huge, large, astronomically big. Big would be an understatement. Very big! Huge! Oh, God! Big! Huge! When it arrives, you better not be alone. Bigfoot! Pizza Hut! From Pizza Hut. Two square feet of pizza. 21 slices on a tasty new crust. $10.99 for up to three toppings. It's bigger than Pizza Pizza. Bigfoot from Pizza Hut. A legendary value. Wednesday on The Bionic Woman. Steve is dying. Now, he told me that you or your people have some kind of a wonder drug. Yes. Bigfoot returns and Jamie Summers fights for her life. This time she won't escape. The Six Million Dollar Man guest stars on The Bionic Woman. Wednesday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on ABC. back to Cinema Insomnia, and Mr. Lobo is here at Exhibit I, or the Bigfoot Information Center. Now their walk-in counter is closed right now, but fortunately for us, they do have a drive-through window. Oh, right, uh, roger that, gold leader. Uh, uh, I would like to report a set of mysterious footprints back in front of the uh, Chinese theater a few miles back. Uh-huh. And uh, also, I'd like uh, one of them uh, Bigfoot long hot dogs with chili and cheese. And could I get a side order of Sasquatch with that? Great. Uh, uh, also, a, a Biggie Fanta orange drink and uh, uh, one of those flags. And, uh, uh, oh, 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 and uh, uh, a Homo erectus t-shirt, the 3X size. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you happen to have the uh, Bigfoot Mysterious Monster DVD. Great, great. Well, could you advance it to chapter four and press play? 
Some anthropologists believe that the abominable snowman is a very primitive species of man. Others think it's a giant anthropoid, an undiscovered ape that has evolved in a direction other than man. They believe that these giant creatures migrated from Asia to America thousands of years ago on what was once the Bering Straits land bridge, which linked Russia to Alaska. In support of this theory, there is the evidence of Bigfoot's continuous presence in Indian history, appearing in various forms on totem poles and paintings, and being called by different names, like Gilwick, Salatik, Oma, Bukwas, and Sasquatch. Part of the North American Indians' mythology from the beginning, Bigfoot was first encountered by a European in 1811. British explorer and mountain man David Thompson noted in his journal that while crossing the Rockies, he came across footprints made by a giant. Footprints whose great size, he wrote, could not have been made by bears. And in July of 1884, British Columbia newspaper carried the account of the capture of a creature. A creature they called Jacko, whose description fits that of a young Bigfoot. Another early account of Bigfoot in America comes from President Theodore Roosevelt in a book he wrote about his days out west. The true story concerns two trappers on the Salmon River. It was in 1852. The trappers encountered the creature Violence followed. One of the men was killed. Roosevelt wrote that he believed the story. In 1924, in British Columbia, a vacationing prospector, Albert Ostman, reported that he was captured and held prisoner by a family of four Bigfoot creatures. Ostman's incredible tale included observations that one scientist felt could only have come from a direct encounter with a large primate species. Ostman signed an affidavit before his death, attesting to the truthfulness of his story. That same year in Washington state, Fred Beck and four other miners reported they shot at two different Bigfoot creatures. Later, Beck and his friends were attacked by an angry group of Bigfoot giants who tried to destroy their cabin by rolling large boulders onto the roof. These and other accounts make up the long history of man's experience with Bigfoot in the forests of America. Stories from the past, colorful and exciting, and yet by themselves, not quite enough to prove that Bigfoot exists. We need something more. The accounts of eyewitnesses today, people whose stories we can check on firsthand, Such is the story of Mary Lou Bowman of a small town in western Michigan. The time, October 6, 1974. The 17-year-old high school senior was waiting for her father. Don Bowman, a former high school football coach and now a respectable businessman, had never heard of the creature that he and his daughter were about to encounter had no idea that the dark road ahead beyond where his daughter stood waiting for him held a promise of terror that would soon bolt up out of the shadows. How was your babysitting? Fine, except I didn't know they'd be on so late. <laughs> found giant footprints in the dirt on the side of the road near the site of the accident. Stories from eyewitnesses like Don Bowman and his daughter are the most compelling evidence for Bigfoot's existence. Oh, I don't know what was in that Sasquatch. Mr. Lobo is uh, going to
going to try and find some pink bismuth for his tummy. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to continue our search for Bigfoot, mighty Aphrodite. I uh, did see something in the uh, sink here that probably should be examined by scientists. Cinema Insomnia, we'll be right back. <music> We're here atop the Coconut Glacier in search of the elusive Sasquatch. There, I see. Wait, you're not the Sasquatch. No, he's my second cousin, twice removed. The abominable snowman? Well, what are you doing here? Oh, I come up to the Kootenays every summer. See, Cousin Sass. Yeah, that's right. You know, we catch a few rays, scare a few hikers. <laughs> <laughs> Have a cool, crisp, glacier fresh Kokanee. Yeah. No. Can't get him in the Himalayas, you know. Uh, uh that's mine oh, right there. Kokanee uh, beer from the Columbia Brewing Company, brewed right in the Kootenays. Uh, you mind getting a picture of us together? Uh, you know, for the mugwump. <laughs> Here in this primitive river bottom wilderness in southern Arkansas, along with deer, duck, crane, and beaver, lurks a creature that walks upright. Whether it is a man, a monster, or a myth, no one really knows. What we do know is the people around Falk, Arkansas, say they have seen such a creature nearly 250 times since 1954. And that this creature, whatever it is, emits one of the most terrifying sounds ever recorded. Creek, rated G. It's 3 a.m. somewhere in the world. Not here, mind you. And you're watching Cinema Insomnia. Why is it that Bigfoot never seems to be spotted by persons of the ethnic persuasion? You know, when Mr. Lobo was in Seattle, they thought I was Bigfoot. They don't get a lot of sun up there. But I didn't wait around for them to prove my existence. And whether or not we can scientifically validate who he is, it doesn't change the fact that Bigfoot is flesh and blood, just as we are, probably, and has feelings, in all likelihood, and a soul or so our best science indicates. So instead, Mr. Lobo is going to tap into the little Bigfoot that's inside himself and in the hearts of each and every life that Bigfoot, uh, not the little Bigfoot that's inside Mr. Lobo, but the big Bigfoot, which is Bigfoot, has touched. And now, back to the movie. Like I say, I'm a barn in the woods, the Cascade Mountains. I know the animals that are here. This was something different that I had never seen before. Large creature, about seven and a half to eight foot tall. It was grayish black in color. And as it went away from me, I seen the back side of it, walking as a man would walk on its hind legs. There were four of us in the car when we, uh, when I was the first one to sight it. 
We pulled up on the freeway and uh, pulled back for optimum viewing. Oh, I'd seen people from the same location and in, in about the same spot before. Humans up there, it, it probably was twice the size. And it was a dark, dark brown, just swaying back and forth, sitting on a rock. It moved more or less like a man, and it was about six, seven feet tall and probably a blackish brown color. And I couldn't see his face because it was running away from me across the road. And I, I actually, her and I both saw it disappear into the brush. I, like I say, I was born and raised around here, and bears just don't walk on these hind legs that long. Another eyewitness of the creature was Shirley Adams, a teacher and school bus driver in a small town on the coast of northern Washington. A longtime resident of the area, the young school teacher had often heard stories about the giant, hairy, ape-like monster, but she had never seen it, never thought she would. Eyewitness testimony, however, has had little such effect on the scientific community. Eyewitness reports are not reliable. People can think they see things. Their minds can play tricks on them. But Dr. Tibbetts, so many people have seen Bigfoot. Now, is it possible that they're all hallucinating? Look, see this skull? Now, that's hard evidence, something to test, to deal with. Bring me a bone or a skull or, or a carcass, and then maybe I'll believe in Bigfoot. Look, hundreds of uh, law-abiding, respectable people have testified that they've seen Bigfoot. They've signed affidavits to that effect. They've even subjected themselves to examination under hypnosis. And yet the scientific community completely disregards such testimony. It's unreliable. Now, isn't it possible that science doesn't know how to use oral evidence? I mean, how to evaluate it, let's say the way the law does. Now, isn't oral testimony the basis of our judicial system? Well, I don't know. Science needs something concrete. Why, for instance, hasn't a hunter ever been able to find the remains of a dead Bigfoot in the forest? I mean, there have been so many people through the area where this thing supposedly has been seen, yet nothing. A valid question. To find out the answer, I talked to anthropologist Dr. Lawrence Bradley. Well, in reality, very few bones are ever found anywhere in the forest. When an animal dies, it's immediately eaten by another animal. This is the disposal service of nature at work. I go up in the woods in Oregon and Washington all the time, and I've never seen the remains of bears or even mountain lions. And these animals are in abundance up there. Well, Dr. Bradley, it's been suggested by some people that maybe the Bigfoot creatures bury their dead. That's remotely possible. If Bigfoot is, as some of us think, a humanoid, a species of animal more man-like than beast. But it is possible. Yes, but it's a proposition completely rejected by my colleagues. But then my colleagues completely reject the possibility of Bigfoot. Bigfoot, most scientists say, cannot exist. But Dan Malachny of Deer Lodge, Montana, disagrees. I don't care what other people think. I saw Bigfoot 10 years ago. I was with 11 other Boy Scouts at the time. After setting up camp, Dan and his friends ate dinner and then sat around and talked, telling jokes until bedtime. The boys were all in their bedrolls and fast asleep by 11 o'clock. where we saw the Bigfoot at, 
And when we got up there, we discovered a number of uh, footprints, the biggest pr footprints I've ever seen. And they look something like this. Exhibit Q, the telephone directory for the entire state of Washington. Conceivably, I could talk to everyone in the state who knows anything about this reclusive giant. Let's start with the A's, shall we? Uh, hello. Yes, uh, Aaron Adamson? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, my name's Mr. Lobo. I'm with the TV's Cinema Insomnia. I was um, wondering if perhaps uh, you knew Bigfoot. Uh, well, it might take me a while to explain. 18-inch uh, feet, 9 feet tall, 800 pounds, distinctive smell. Really? Massage? Um, excuse me. It's getting kind of interesting. Um, why don't uh, you enjoy tonight's intermission and uh, come back here in about uh, 10 minutes where we'll have more of Bigfoot, Mysterious Monster, and his baby soft hands. All right, now tell me that last part again, o only slower. <laughs> Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Hi, I'm Chili Dilly, the personality pickle. Packed in a jar for the freshest flavor. Served cold in a sack for you to savor. So dainty to eat, no muss, no fuss. An ideal snack for all of us. Crisp, tender, and tasty with a bit of spice. Buy one now. Taste how nice. Snack bar clerks will knock themselves silly, speeding your order for a real chili dilly. Extraterrestrials, strange phenomena, missing persons, lost continents, myths, and monsters. We examine these mysteries to determine are they bull or not? London's West End. Here, in the winter of 1888, a series of bizarre and violent murders occurred, which remain unsolved to this very day. Jack the Ripper. Was he a prosperous London surgeon? Perhaps a member of British royalty? Well, our bullshit team has unearthed spectacular new evidence which suggests that Jack the Ripper was, in fact, the Loch Ness Monster. Is it possible that Nessie murdered five streetwalkers before returning to Loch Ness? Using undiscovered evidence, we've pieced together the events leading up to the first murder Although this is a bull reenactment, it may have happened just this way. Hello, dearie. Show you a good time for a quid. For the wife and for free. Oh, gents, don't you want a girl to keep you warm tonight? <sighs> me mum told me there would be nights like this. Oh, my. You are a big one now, aren't you? Come on, darling. Ow. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> 
Is this the way it happened? Was Jack the Ripper, in fact, a 60-foot sea serpent from Scotland? Did I take this job for a quick buck? We may never know the answer to these questions. Drive away your worries and cares at this drive-in theater, where you will see the finest motion pictures of all time soon to be released. Drama, comedy, adventure, excitement, something for everyone. Is the army mobilizing? Drone Ship 4 is picking up a flurry of activity on one of the Kurgalon substars board. This doesn't look good. I'll show you, Tin Man. These odds ain't looking so hot. And this Sasquatch ain't going down with the ship. <laughs> This is Mr. Lobo, and I'm here with horror film director Jonathan Mum, who has made a terrifying film about the legend of Bigfoot. No, no, I'm sorry. It's, it's not about Bigfoot. It's about the Chupacabras. It's the legend of the Chupacabras. Bloodthirst, the legend of the Chupacabras. But Chupacabra, of course, is Spanish for Bigfoot. No, Chupacabras is Spanish for goat sucker, which, are we allowed to say that on TV? No, no, I don't think you can. Although, of course, if you speak Spanish, we've been saying it. No, the Chupacabras is not Bigfoot. The Chupacabras is a Mexican, Puerto Rican, South American myth. It's about a creature that preys upon farm animals, attacks goats, drains them of their blood, sucks the blood, if you will, hence the term goat sucker, Chupacabras. But you see, it is my theory, and it is a controversial one, and I admit that it's controversial, and I think really deep down this is why my film has gotten such vicious vicious reviews on internet websites horror movie fan websites have not taken to this film and i think it's because they don't like my theory and my theory is that the chupacabras is actually the mocha vampire and you see i'll, t I'll tell you why i'll tell you why because you see fifty years ago were you going to say something i was going to say regular decaf oh mocha vampire oh, i was kind of lame all right go ahead regular i think okay anyway you see, 50 years ago, there was this occurrence of these farm animals being killed, being drained of their blood, particularly goats. And this creature that they blame these instances on, instances, is that a word? I don't know. I think it might be Spanish. Mm, maybe it is. I don't really speak Spanish, mm -hmm. you know. Lo siento, pero no puedo hablar español. What did I just say? Si. Okay. Anyway. You see, they called it the Mocha Vampire. Then, 50 years later, you flash forward. Actually, you, you flash forward? You fast forward? Sure. Anyway, you go forward into the future. You become to today. Now you've got these farm animals. They're being killed. They're being drained of their blood. And the young people, not knowing the history, not knowing anything about the Mocha Vampire, begin to call it the Chupacabras. The Chupacabras. It's more hip. It's more today. It's more modern. It's now. It's now. It's happening. It's like the Macarena. It's the chupacabras. Right. But uh, really, chupacabra, I mean, if you, if you look at, 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 the, at the film we're watching tonight, the way Peter Graves explains it, it has to be Bigfoot, because Bigfoot is the unexplainable. So logically, everything that is unexplainable is Bigfoot. Jersey Devil, Bigfoot. Noxy Monster, Bigfoot. Easter Bunny, Bigfoot. You understand? <laughs> Whoever uses logic like that is a Noxy moron. But, but I tell you what, you know what? I have brought the trailer to my film with me. Why don't you have a look, and then I think maybe you'll understand. And maybe they'll understand. You brought a trailer to the woods?
Yes, toddy, the chocolate malt in a can. It's so good hot. It's so good cold. It hits the spot with young and old. Yes, toddy pleases everybody. Delicious chocolate malted toddy made with rich, real milk, not powdered milk. So come and get it, everybody. It's time to drink your chocolate toddy. Mmm, delicious. One hundred and thirty-four political careers ended October 7th, 2003. The survivors of the recall war called it Election Day. Many of them were hired as late-night movie hosts, only to face a new nightmare. The war against Mr. Lobo. You're not dreaming. You're watching cinema. Insomnia. I'm Mr. Lobo. Sure, I was skeptical at first, but then Peter Graves presented the overwhelming testimony of nine-year-old children who ordinarily would never see monsters after dark at bedtime. Then there's the eerily similar tale of the Loch Ness Monster who is now proven beyond real. All those credible actors pretending to be scientists, um, the folks at the brewery and the snake oil salesman convention. Mr. Lobo is convinced. I am now a bona fide Bigfoot believer. As far as I'm concerned, we could stop this movie right now. Bigfoot is among us. But I don't think you're convinced. Don't argue with Mr. Lobo. I can see it all over your face. You know what you need to do. Strap on your size 18s. It's time to make tracks into real six. A big foot. The forbidden dance. Did it be the footprints? Some 20 inches long, eight inches wide, Footprints found impressed two inches deep into the earth, an inch and a half deeper than a normal man's. There are a number of um, footprints that I've seen that uh, are faked, and this can be done. But on the other hand, there are a few that show some characteristics that I think could not have been faked. This is one such footprint. This uh, cast, I've uh, drawn in the approximate reconstructions of the bones. This uh, is a crippled individual where a couple of bulges have extended out between adjacent bones on the outer edge of the foot. If this had been a human foot, these bulges would have been farther back. But they're shifted forward, making the heel longer and the front of the foot shorter. This is exactly what is required for a 
foot that's going to carry a, perhaps an 800 pound body. Now, I don't think any faker could have thought of it and figured this out and adjusted his footprint accordingly. A fake footprint is just simply an ex expanded, enlarged uh, footprint or an enlarged copy of a human foot. With this convincing background, I now thought it best to talk to a trained observer who personally discovered such giant tracks, like newspaper man Ed McLarney of Stevenson, Washington. I turned my head and looked in the direction Marv was pointing. Down, down below us, for as far as the eye could see, were two sets of tracks coming parallel up this terrifically ste steep ridge. They crossed the road. We walked up the road just a little bit farther, and they crossed the road right in front of us. Big, big tracks. I went to Peter Hurkos, the world's foremost psychic detective at his home in Los Angeles. I took with me, unknown to him and concealed in a suitcase, a plaster cast of a giant Bigfoot footprint. Hurkos, who has worked with police on such cases as the Boston Strangler and the Ann Arbor murders, has the unusual psychic gift of being able to read facts from unseen objects, to sense the reality and truth of such objects, and to describe in detail from telepathic images in his brain what is hidden from his view. I didn't know what to do with it. But I'd do any type of science may impose. Now, I have something inside this case that I want to know something more about. Yeah. Now, can you psychometrize what's in here without ever having seen it? And tell me something about it, anything? I, I will try. All right. That's in a uh, half, half man, half uh, animal. Eat part of animals, uh, the intestine and animals. Eat and also berries and green stuff. It's uh, not a gorilla, it's like an... Uh, a man, uh, strong chest and uh, long arms, uh, normal fingers like we have, uh, very hairy, long hair and short beard type. Peter, do you want me to draw the picket the way I see the... Will you? Yes, sure. Yeah. We've witnessed a dazzling display of Peter Herko's psychic powers. Powers that not only determined what was in a closed case, but powers that said the object in that case was authentic, not a fake. That it was made by a living creature, by a Bigfoot. We at Cinema Insomnia hope you're intrigued with tonight's documentary about Bigfoot. Mr. Lobo would like to now demonstrate the mystic art of psychometrizing. Exhibit you. This box. There's something. Something inside this box. Something that's inside. And it's smaller. What's inside this box is smaller than the box. Notice that no part of the inside of the box is on the outside of the box. It's angry. What's in this box is angry. It belongs to a, a hominid, biped, smelly, doesn't take good care of himself, low intelligence. What's in this box belongs to a tall, smelly, slow, dirty, hairy mud creature. Wait, <laughs> Mr. Lobo's lunch is inside this box. Well, then what's in my lunch pail then? <clears throat> That's an odd taste. Um, see if you can down these uh, next messages. Um, 
secretly hiding in the darkest forest of the great Northwest. Bigfoot is here. KTEL's Bigfoot is here, and far from frightening, it can be great fun. You can make footprints in the snow. Follow the leader. Make up your own game. Bigfoot, you're fun. Bigfoot from KTEL. Like you, like you, I love to shred. But even a hardcore skateboarder like myself slams sometimes. Have you been injured in a skateboard or skateboard-related accident while grinding, thrashing, or catching wicked air, neck, or back injuries? Road rash, hippers, split kneecaps, lost shoes? I can help. I'm on your side. I'm Rad Abrams, skateboard attorney. Dude, Rad Abrams got me $78, and he got me a beer. That's right. I'll even get you beer. And remember, there's no fee until we win. Let Rad Abrams hook you up. Don't delay. Call Rad Abrams and Associates today. Look for our ad in Pleasure Magazine. Later days, dudes. This waitress has served hundreds of customers. Surely, at some point, she's poured a cup of Joe or served a damn fine slice of cherry pie to Mr. Gigantopithecus or one of his hominid homies from the forest moon that time forgot. Now, you are under Mr. Lobo's power. You're going back. Back. It's summertime, 1969. Summertime, 1969. You put on your uniform and go to work. It's like any other day, except there's someone at the counter that you've never seen before. I'm putting, I'm putting Cheerios up my nose. In the restaurant? I'm only three years old. Oh, uh, sorry, um, it's, it's summertime, 1989. It's summertime, 1989. You know, this isn't going to be quite as easy as Mr. Lobo thought. Perhaps I should practice my powers of persuasion on a more impressionable subject. Please assume the position after me. I, as initiated member of the sleepless nights of insomnia, do solemnly swear to watch the movie, the whole movie, and nothing but the movie, so help me, Mr. Lobo. You may stand down. And now, let's go back. Back. Back into the movie. No. No. Quiet, you! Give me another refill. And a short stack. Drift deeper and deeper into relaxed state. You could hear me clearly. Let your whole body become calm and relaxed. Now you can recall scenes as I ask you questions. They'll be very vivid, very clear to you. But you are safe and sound. You are safe and sound at home. Jerry, you could hear me clearly. What were you frightened of? It, it was big, and it smelled terrible. It was big and smelled terrible? Yes. It, it, it just, it smelled terrible. It smelled terrible. Can you describe what frightened you even more? Most of all. Is it getting to the kids? It was it's terrible. It's terrible. 
terrible. It was, it was, it, it was like a, I can't explain it. It's just big, hairy, and it hurt me. How big do you believe it was? Using hypnosis as a tool to help us establish the truth, we have verified an actual eyewitness account of an encounter with Bigfoot. I took the sound tapes recorded by Alan Berry to Dr. Robert Sheldon. Not knowing what strange creature made these sounds, Dr. Sheldon subjected them to a rigorous computer analysis. How do you go about analyzing these tapes? The first thing we do is to digitize this the sound into the computer. Digitizing consists of converting each second of sound into 20,000 numbers uh, that are stored in the files on the computer. We can select uh, any portion of this we'd like and uh, do a frequency analysis on this portion. We can look at the movement of the frequencies and say something about the articulatory flexibility. During the 15 minutes of sound on this tape, uh, we have examples of three vowels, e, eh, a, eh, and o. Oh. But nowhere on the tape is there the sound e. Now, the sound e requires moving the tongue forward in the mouth. And uh, if we look at the uh, physical structure of, say, a gorilla, the gorilla has the neck at a different angle, and it's impossible for the gorilla to move his tongue forward in order to make the E sound. Uh, the fact that we don't see this sound on the tape uh, suggests that this creature perhaps had, uh, did not have the ability to make that sound. Do you know what made these sounds? No, I don't. Well, the first Exhibit C. The sounds made by an unknown creature, probably Bigfoot. That consists of Sounds that seem to indicate that the creature is more man than ape. Similar sounds to those heard by Alan Berry and his friends have been heard by others, by those on expeditions searching for Bigfoot, and by men like Hal Williamson of Idaho. Williamson, a longtime fisherman and outdoorsman, was vacationing in British Columbia, Canada, when he first heard the strange sounds, coming, it seemed, from a great distance. The sounds seemed to be coming closer, and suddenly they were upon him. A confident sportsman, Williamson was determined to find out more about the creature he heard and saw. The air was heavy with a foul odor, a stench Williamson later described as being, in his own words, one of the worst smells he's ever experienced. His curiosity outweighing his fears, Williamson, unarmed, made his way to the area where he had spotted the Bigfoot. Silence now replaced the eerie screams of the giant creature. But the stench in the air told Williamson that the monster was still nearby. Later, hair found nearby was classified as belonging to no known animal. Spurred on by the increasing numbers of sightings, by the accumulating data pointing to the creature's possible existence, more and more organized expeditions are taking to the field to find a Bigfoot. He threw a couple of wild parties late at night. Mostly kept to himself, though. Seemed nice enough, though. He was always washing that enormous truck of his. Man, what an eyesore that was. The tires were as tall as I was. 
I'd hate to think of what an insurance cost on a thing like that. My wife would never let me have something like that. Thank you, Exhibit R, neighbor of Bigfoot. Cinema Insomnia will be right back after this compelling testimony. <laughs> It's the Six Million Dollar Man and Bigfoot the Bionic Beast. Drag Race Dynamite. New from Kenner, the TTP Dual Launch Drag Set. With a Six Million Dollar Man and his Bionic Mission Cycle against Bionic Bigfoot Jet Style Ice Cycle. One start trigger turns them loose. Come on, Steve. It's Bionic Bigfoot against the Six Million Dollar Man. Come on, Bigfoot. Let's do it again. TTP Dual Launch Drag Set. Some assembly required. Check one. My boyfriend's a big idiot. Check one. I said I would come on this trip to help you with your film, but I'm not about to say that I believe in Bigfoot. Well, then why are you here? I like being with you. I just don't want you to think I'm crazy. Pets and people go missing all the time. I'll go in there myself. You can just stay here in town if you want. You believe any nut job out there that says Sasquatch is real? Your friends will all think you're crazy, and you'll spend all of your days searching for something that you never find. I never felt this way about anyone. It's about 29 miles north of here, you come to the bottom of Bluff Creek. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> We're here. When you get in there, it's a steep canyon, there's a running creek, there's forest, it's thick, and you're gonna feel how isolated they were. Kelly, come here. The real truth of it is you're out in the middle of nowhere. How do we know we're going in the right direction? You don't want to be in the movie, and now you're Stanley fucking Kubrick. Turn off the camera. There's a lot of people uh, living back in these woods, and they just don't like other people in their business. You see the buckshot on the sign? It what is. is my sock doing in the tree? Did you hear that? And now it's time for another insomniac mail sack. Dear Mr. Lobo, my bunkie and I get up early for kitchen detail and watch your show, Insomnia Theater. Your skin looks smooth on TV. I bet you have big feet. XOXOX, Todd the Donkey Johnson, inmate 62927. Well, Todd, <laughs> FYI, the show is Cinema Insomnia, not Insomnia Theater. Thousands of people make that mistake. Exhibit H, the still photographs. This one taken in 1965 in Oregon by an experienced woodsman, Zach Hamilton. And this one taken in 1974 in British Columbia, Canada by an Ohio woman on vacation. And a third one taken in Alaska in 1973. Pictures of the creature would seem to be all the proof that's needed to confirm Bigfoot's existence. And the most famous picture of Bigfoot is this one, taken by Yakima Washington rodeo rider Roger Patterson in 1967 in Bluff Creek, California. Patterson took about 28 feet of motion picture film, the most controversial film of its kind. It startled the scientific world. Anthropologist Grover Krantz of Washington State University, Dr. Donald W. Grieve, a London scientist, and Dr. Dmitry Donsky, the chief of biomechanics at a Russian institute, all studied the film, and they could find no reason to doubt the film's authenticity. Three. This is Mr. Lobo for Cinema Insomnia, and I'm here at Washougal Elementary, where I'm talking with fifth grade teacher Horace Sheptigard. Very nice to meet you, sir. Apparently you knew Bigfoot quite well. First of all, call me Howard. Uh, it's been a number of years since I've talked about it. Uh, we didn't know him as Bigfoot. We called him Mickey. Mickey Tetweiler was his name that we knew. Mickey? It was given to him by the, uh, the sisters up at the Carmelite Monastery. Do you want to know how it all started? Absolutely, Greta. Well, he wasn't raised by a pack of wolves. Let's get rid of that myth, first of all. 
Now, he was left at the doorstep of the Carmelite Monastery up at uh, Kuskuski, up in the Blue Mountains. There's a beautiful Carmelite Monastery up there. And Sister Antonilla, Antonilda really took care of him. I mean, she really took him un under her wings. And, and um, she was an extern. They have an intern and an extern, and she was the one who could leave and get groceries down the city. And, and she raised him for all intents and purposes. And, and then when he was old enough, he came to town. He, was, he really got caught up in the whole foster youth program and a judge, Charlie Flathers, took him under his wings. He was his guardian. He took over his guardianship. And um, he worked his way up through uh, Washougal Elementary. I became his fifth grade teacher, and uh, I knew he was coming. We all knew he was coming, actually. Tall for his age. First thing I remember, the custodian, Mr. Jim, loved this kid. He never had to get the ladder out to, to put up the, net, the nets on the basketball hoops. Mickey was always willing to help. He, he'd get the balls that went up on the roof. Custodian just loved this kid. He was great. He was in my class. I do recall there were some issues, though. There's some problems. Is, do you want me to cover that? The, Absolutely. Go right ahead. I, I think it might, you know, testify to kind of his character and what happened later in life. But uh, I haven't talked about it for a long time. Okay. Every year, I give the uh, you know the family life education speech. In fifth grade, it pretty much revolves around body odor. You know, how the body's changing. You know. Puberty, that sort of thing. Yeah, puberty hit this kid pretty hard. Along with the hair and everything, he, he, uh, he smelled. Normally, my deodorant speech consists of two words. Use it. That's all I say, and we move on. But in his case, I had to add three words. Really? That's right. Really use it. Oh. I think he was traumatized by that. You know, I kind of made a scene in front of everybody. I didn't mean to. I was sensitive to his feelings. But um, Another thing that happened, he was always getting called to the nurse's office because he had lice. Mm -hmm. And the, the county rule is if you have lice, you, you have to get rid of the lice. And the tangles in the hair and the family and the, you know, the judge couldn't handle that. Judge, judge Flathers just had a difficult time. So he was out of school a lot. And this kid was a runner. I mean, the slightest little thing would set him off. He would just take off. He was always running constantly. But there was a third thing that happened. Uh, I think it's probably the, the catalyst to what caused him to eventually is really take off for good. You remember the documentary, uh, the miniseries Roots? Yes, I've heard of it. Okay, now after Roots, you know, Alex Haley, uh, after that show aired, everybody in the brother was involved in genealogy. Okay, you gotta look up your roots, you gotta look up your roots. So, you know, a teacher gave me a ditto, and they said, here, pass out this uh, family tree ditto. All right, I passed out the family tree ditto. Everybody got one. There's Mickey. And the poor kid, I, mean, I didn't even think about it. Sister Antonilda, Judge Charlie Flathers, that's all he had. That's all he knew. Poor kid, he had, he had a picture of the nun on one side and the judge on the other. Everybody else had the great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, everything. He had nothing. He took off. He ran. It was over. I just, I, Sad. I, I felt like it was my fault. For years, I've kind of held that in, but I didn't hear from him for a long, long time. Well, he graduated. Eventually he came back, but he graduated. I, and after that, I didn't hear from him for a long time. I, in fact, there were two occasions. Do you want me to go into that? Absolutely. Okay, the first one, I got a call out of the blue, middle of a snowstorm. The kid's calling me from Snoqualmie Pass uh, here in Washington. And pay phone, stuck, hungry, wants a ride. I went up. I told him no questions asked. I'd pick him up, bring him back to the judge. I did. Brought him back. Second time. This one was bizarre. The, the police picked this kid up. He was in the middle of an onion field in Walla Walla. An onion field? Well, you know the Walla Walla sweet onions. They're famous for that. Yes. He's just devouring this farmer's onions right and left. They picked him up. Man, he smelled. That was something else. Again, no questions asked. Brought him home. And then, you know, he took off again. I, I haven't seen him since then. That's been a long time. Sorry, I just... All right. It's okay. No, I haven't talked about it in a while. I feel kind of bad, but, you know, because I know what happened later. But, uh, I miss that kid. Thank you, Mr. Jeff DeGard, fifth grade teacher of Bigfoot. And now cinema insomnia must break for these important messages. <laughs> Holy crap.
crap, was that a Sasquatch? Holy crap, was that a Hyundai? Introducing the 2013 Genesis Coupe. You won't believe it's a Hyundai. Hello, Sheriff. It's something terrible happened. Another one of them preacher stories. Only this one tops them all. It took off with this girl, he thinks. <laughs> what do these creatures want? The only thing I can figure out is that they're a dying race. And they want to reproduce more of their own kind. Catch one of these critters. We can live high on the hog for the rest of our lives. But all I want to do is get my girl back. I got guns and lights out in the car. Now stop! Practically subhuman. Except they still look like animals. How horrible. That's my crit up there! You're not dreaming, dreaming, dreaming. You're watching cinema. Insomnia. This is Mr. Lobo for Cinema insomnia and believe it or not this young lady is old enough to be bigfoot's prom date yeah this, this is the dress i wore that night i even saved the corsage it's very nice well actually i had to let the butt out it's gotten enormous i don't like my body so um you were bigfoot's prom date yeah yeah that's right we went we didn't have a limo he picked me up in that big damn truck but at least he was nice enough to run a ladder up so I could get in. And then we doubled with those Amish lesbians. They made a lot of noise in the back. But the, the truck was nice. I think he was taking it to rallies or something. Sounds like a fairy tale. So uh, did this dream date end, as they say, happily ever after? Well, you know what they say about big feet? It's not true. All right. Uh, thank you, Exhibit 37, ex-prom date of Bigfoot. Um, this ought to stir up some memories. Patterson took his famous film while on an expedition with a colleague. They were tracking down the giant, hairy, man-like monster. Patterson had been searching for the creature for eight years. Suddenly, there was a commotion. Patterson's horse reared, throwing him. Patterson grabbed his camera and filmed as he ran. Here is his actual footage, the images he captured, what he called the abominable snowman of America, or Bigfoot. If this film is legitimate, then there can no longer be any question about Bigfoot's existence. To verify its legitimacy, I went to anthropologist Grover Krantz at Washington State University. There is one film that was made by Roger Patterson in 1967 of what appears to be a Sasquatch that I am reasonably convinced now is a legitimate piece of film. I've checked just about every possible measurement of that film, have, having looked at it, oh, at least 50 times now. And I don't think there's any way Patter Patterson could have figured this all out and faked it. I also asked Dr. Jeffrey Bourne, director of the prestigious Yerkes Primate Lab in Atlanta, Georgia, to analyze the film. Well, you know, uh, that looks to me very much like a human walk. Its gait is very much uh, of a human-type gait. If you have a large primate who has basically the bipedal locomotion, he would have to have a human-like gait. This is exactly what I would expect. And also, when you look at its, um, at its feet as it walks, uh, the undersurface is uh, much too light colored for an animal with this kind of dark fur. The light color on the bottom of the feet is perfectly normal for um, any primate, or, well, most hominid-like primates. Um, Africans with uh, black skin have very light colored uh, soles of the feet. This is simply because the stratum corneum is very thick and carries less of the pigment. And furthermore, it seems to have uh, the characteristics of both male and female. The head has a big 
crest on it like a male gorilla does and this uh, crest is called a sagittal crest. Now this creature also has pendulous breasts which is a female characteristic. The crest, the sagittal crest on the top of the head has been um, claimed as a male characteristic uh, in the Patterson film. Well, yes, it's a characteristic of adult male gorillas and orangutans, but it's not a male characteristic, it's a size characteristic. Beyond a certain size, the jaw muscles must find attachment on a special crest, and it happens that only male gorillas and orangutans get that big. If there were a female primate of the five to 500 pound body size, it would have to be so big that it would have a crest as well. So it's not a male characteristic. And the breasts are covered in fur, and in all other primates, the breasts are actually either bare or very sparsely haired. I don't know what the breast of a Sasquatch ought to look like. Uh, of course, what's going on there is, in Patterson's film, the creature has a, a bulge here, which seems to be a two-part bulge, but it's not really very clear. This might not actually be uh, uh, breasts. These could be outpouchings from the uh, trachea, which occur in um, many large apes, called laryngeal air sacs. Patterson, who died of cancer in 1972, swore on his deathbed that this film was authentic. His partner that day also swears that what you are seeing now is a picture of a real Bigfoot. Satisfied with this evidence, some scientists are now trying to classify the Bigfoot creatures, declaring them to be perhaps a more evolved species of a fossilized ape, a more man-like Gigantopithecus. They've begun to study the living habits of the creatures, based on the voluminous accounts of eyewitnesses for the past hundred years. They've determined that there is a large colony of the creatures, perhaps 200 of them, centered mainly in the Pacific Northwest. They're nomadic creatures who travel in small groups and oftentimes alone, following the food supply. They're mainly vegetarians, eating roots, berries, fruits, and nuts. Some have been seen, though not frequently, eating small rodents like field mice. There have even been accounts of them digging for clams at an ocean beach. Bigfoot creatures have also been seen pulling fish from the streams and taking them from fishermen's barrels outside their homes. I'm here with musician Scott Moon. Tell me what you remember about Bigfoot. Well, back in the 80s, we were in a band together, one of those hair bands. Uh, it's called The Endowed. And uh, I played keyboards, he played lead bass. I don't know, we just toured, you know, typical stuff, get drunk, trash hotel rooms, you know, do groupies, stuff like that. Um, well, we did one album um, called Extra Hold, and it had a kind of a hit called Twice My Stride. Uh, you ever hear of it? No, I haven't. Oh, well, we were almost on Solid Gold once. Hey, Rockstar! The toilet's overflowed in the ladies' room again! I gotta get back to work. Thank you, former bandmate of Bigfoot. Cinema Insomnia must pause now for uh, station identification. Check, please. <laughs> Tell Records presents the one, the only, Ambassador Phantom on one long playing album, Candles, Crankhorn, and You. Oh yeah, come on over here. Super on Planet Crankhorn, he sold more records than oh, Perry Como, yeah. Boxcar Willie, Jerry Vale, Red Sovine, Slim Whitman, and Zam Fear combined. Unforgettable. Ah. Finally, 
this exclusive TV offer, Lost Youth can once again be yours on LP, 8-track tape, or Cosmic Spool for only nine payments of $9.99 plus $99 shipping and payments. Caustic Vapors can blow it in. And if you Brother, order now, we'll send you this free bonus disc. Ambassador Phantom of Crankhor narrates Peter and the Wolf. Peter looked up and shouted, Where is that miserable scum? I'll make mincemeat out of him. Hurry, operators are standing by. Order candles, Crankhor, and you today, or... We're gonna kill some children. My uncle has a cabin in the interior. Perfect locale to lay back. A cabin? This one's cool. Where exactly is this cabin, Donna? It's about a two-day drive from here. Then we'll hike the rest of the way about 20 miles total but we got a lot to carry so it'll be slow going how far is the cabin there is no cabin only the discovery of a lifetime i had a vision look over and there he is he's just staring at me what are you looking for sasquatch bigfoot i finally understand why i couldn't find him once i prove myself worthy they're gonna accept me into their fault This is Mr. Lobo, and I've been here for hours with Bigfoot's college roommate. Bigfoot. He's still going by Bigfoot. Well, his name's Maurice, all right? Bigfoot was his name in college. That was his nickname. That's what we called him. He's still going by it? It's kind of sad, really. See, there were three of us. He was Bigfoot. He was the third one. He was the Johnny-come-lately we had a buddy named Jimmy, he was Big Knees, and I was Big Nip. So uh, they called us the Big Three and walked around. <laughs> we used to get a lot of them, mm-hmm, if you know what I'm talking about. But uh, he was always a hanger-on. He was always trying to get my cast off so everybody knew who the real sex symbol was. Tell you what, though, that guy could talk. He had a bunch of ideas all the time. He was talking about the Internet before there was an internet. I'm serious. It was like 76. So, uh, he was always talking about how one of these days, as soon as they invent the internet, then I'm going to invent a search engine right after that. I got the paperwork ready, man. He was always talking about that. And uh, he was going to put his name on it and everything. I don't know. He had other ideas, too, and never quite panned out for him. He was going to start his own pizza place. He always had this idea that one large pizza wasn't enough for him. So what he wanted to do was, I want to take two pizzas, make them squares, and jam them together like a big freaking Kit Kat. And he thought that would be a good idea, like somebody would really go for that. <clears throat> I mean, I used to have fun with them. I mean, you know, I had a lot of things going on, though. We kind of eventually drifted apart. I got my own projects to do right now. For example... I'm cataloging uh, episodes of Doctor Who according to which Monty Python members appeared in them. And uh, then I'm actually budgeting my time so that I can actually watch each end, uh, each episode individually. But only on the birthdays of the individual actors that actually appeared in them. So I was always very, very proud of that. See, I had goals. But Bigfoot, as he likes to be called... He just wanted to ride somebody else's coattails. We knew George Lucas was uh, getting ready to do this film. We knew it was going to be big. I knew it was going to be big. And uh, I told him, hey, look, he wants aliens, man. You're big. You just, you go out there, we do a screen test. We, uh, You know, not a screen test. We're going to do something a little avant-garde, my friend. He said, what's avant-garde? I said, don't worry about it. And we shot him in the woods, right? And we sent the video in, and that was going to be his... Uh, his uh, screen test, but uh, got lost. He never got to play Chewbacca. It was pretty sad. I saw the thing the other day. I mean, honestly, every time they show that video, it's just him walking in the woods. Uh, I shot the whole thing. I should get some royalties off that. Crap, I'll tell you what. Thank you, college roommate of Bigfoot. Exhibit E. The Minnesota Iceman. 
what might have been the only body of a Bigfoot ever found by modern man. At first, nothing more than a carnival exhibit, a rotting corpse partially visible in a block of ice. Later to be thought of by at least two international scientists as an unknown large primate, perhaps the dead body of a young Bigfoot. This unusual evidence mysteriously disappeared in 1968. For Exhibit G, I traveled to a small Washington town not far from the Canadian border, increasingly more intrigued by the abundance of psychic and physical evidence. The most compelling evidence for Bigfoot's existence, however, remains the eyewitness reports. And the most compelling of these are when the creature has been seen at the same time by more than one person. Now, in police work, this is called corroboration, and it's another way to establish the truth. Now, there are scores of such corroborative stories in the Bigfoot investigation, but the most interesting to me are these. This file contains the accounts of over a dozen sightings of Bigfoot, all taking place within a 30-day period in this small Washington town. It was during a salmon run on the river, and Mr. and Mrs. Tom Stern were the first to encounter the creature. It was during September 1975. Great day for fishing. Yes, it really is. Say, by the way, what time's your brother coming over this evening? Oh, I don't know, fairly early. There's something wrong with this reel. That's yeah, the one you wanted, sweetheart. I don't know, maybe it's me. I don't seem to be working it right. <laughs> well, you work it right and catch some fish, and I promise I'll fry them. <laughs> Would you mind taking a look at it? What is that? Expeditions like this one have gone out armed with tranquilizing guns and cameras. The object is to bring back evidence to force the scientific establishment to take a more active part in the search for Bigfoot. Though it did not find a Bigfoot, this team did find hair and fecal droppings. Evidence found on expeditions like that of Robert Morgan's and evidence found by chance by hunters and hikers eventually finds its way into scientific laboratories like this one. Some of it has yielded interesting results. For instance, though some feces collected and turned in are found to be that of bears or other animals, others remain unexplained, unidentifiable, possibly from a creature unknown to science. Now, a great deal can be learned from droppings. For example, the eating habits of the creature, which in turn can help those who are looking for Bigfoot. Now, the Morgan expedition reports that examination of feces leads them to believe that Bigfoot feeds on roots and grass and berries and tree shoots. And therefore, in their search for Bigfoot, they are following the growth of these succulents. Now, samples of hair believed to be that of Bigfoot are frequently brought in for examination. And again, though most of it turns out to be that of bears or some other known animal, there is that occasional finding, a strand of hair that defies analysis. Not that of a bear, not a man or a coyote or a wolf, but of something unknown. Thank you. Now, these hair samples were found at the site of giant human-like footprints and after a sighting of a Bigfoot creature. The hair samples, then, should be labeled Exhibit B a piece of evidence which the United States Army has endorsed in its official engineering atlas covering the state of Washington. In a section about the wildlife of the state, Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, is featured. The text goes on to report that hair samples sent to the FBI labs have defied analysis. Exhibit X. This nylon hair has been classified as belonging to no known animal. I'm here with Makeover Maven, Laura de Priest, at the Great Northwest branch of her salon and day spa. Laura, have you ever cut hair like this before? Yes. On who? Well, we don't like to divulge our client list, but he was really big, and he was a very nice guy. He wanted a makeover, but I thought maybe you should go with your 
you know, your signature look. So we did the big hair thing. We left it long on top, shaggy on the sides. Did a brow wax. That was about it. And you know, he was a nice guy, but not a very good tipper. He tipped me with a raccoon's head or some animal like that. I didn't think it was very good, considering I had to wash him three or four times. You know. Thank you, Laura. Likely barber of Bigfoot. Hairstylist. Uh, hairstylist of Bigfoot. Cinema Insomnia will be right back. <laughs> Jack Link's Beef Jerky presents Messin' with Sasquatch. Hey there, big guy. You know, you look a little tired. Why don't you come sit down over here? Yeah, come on. That's right, sit down. <laughs> Jack Link's Jerky. Feed your wild side. My grandfather used to tell me stories all about this one soldier. As he got older, the stories got stranger. Some I believed, others I don't know. But it wasn't describing a man. Wallet, keys. It was more like something mythic, legendary. You didn't pull any swords from any stones, did you? But you might have done something. Something bigger, maybe. So how have you been? You look a little tired. What's bothering you? Things I could have done differently. Regrets. No, I shot someone during the war. I never wanted that. Even if he had it coming. And he did. You've heard about the killings up north? What's the FBI have to do with it? Imagine all our worst fears about influenza and humans, bovine, swine, all of it coming true to life, only worse. It's the Bigfoot, Ed. They want me to kill it. It's the carrier of this plague type thing. Well, that's no good. If we cannot contain the beast, if we cannot destroy it, then it escapes. It could mean the very end of our world as we know it. You're the last resort. Exhibit 44D. I found this primate uh, in an alley behind the dry cleaners drinking woolite out of a bag. I've hooked him up to this polygraph machine or lie detector to determine if this unfortunate creature is indeed Bigfoot. Now I'm going to have to ask you the same 12 questions a hundred times. Uh, during this final reel of Bigfoot Monolith Monster. Is that all right? Fine. One down, 11 more to go. Are you comfortable? Great. Are you now, or have you ever been, a Bigfoot? Ten ten p.m., September 12, 1975. Rita Graham was alone in the living room watching television.
There were 10 more such sightings in the town within the next three weeks. Oh, no! One town, a number of sightings. Now, is it possible that so many people over a period of time could fabricate and maintain their stories, that is, tell lies, or are they telling the truth? With me is William Stenberg, a former police officer for the Glendale Police Department, a man licensed by the state of California to do polygraph work, that is, to conduct lie detector examinations. We're about to test the story of one of those townspeople, Johnny Green, whose story you've just seen. We're going to give him a lie detector test to see if he was telling the truth. In order that the test meet every standard of normal investigative work, our cameras will not intrude on the examination. We'll watch from back here through a two-way mirror. Johnny's reactions will not be altered by our presence. Were you truthful to me when you described the creature seven feet tall, heavy build, covered with hair and a head shaped like a gorilla? Yes. To complete a polygraph test, Stenberg asks the same 12 questions three times each. Have you lied to me on any of these questions? No. Test is complete, John. Please remain seated. The polygraph machine confirms that John Green did see something that night in the Nooksack River, something large and hairy, something John Green and his neighbors call Bigfoot. Man or beast? What it is is still unknown. Some believe that Bigfoot is a kind of ape undiscovered by science, or a prehistoric species of ape thought to be extinct. Others speculate it might be the so-called missing link or even early man. Whatever it is, the volume of evidence seems conclusive. Our Earth is host to such giant creatures as the Bigfoot. There are the sightings corroborated by hypnosis and polygraph tests, the footprints, the sound recordings, the photographs, the film, all enough to prove that Bigfoot is as much a part of our life as the gorilla or the Loch Ness Monster. Bigfoot is today free to roam the forests of America, living off the land but leaving no trace of his passage except for an occasional footprint. He's gigantic and powerful, and yet he harms nobody and destroys nothing. He is at peace with the wilderness. Possible. According to this polygraph machine or lie detector, this hairy, indigent primate is an imposter. So the question remains where is Bigfoot? We should have known all along that this unemployable dumpster diver couldn't be Bigfoot. I mean, sure, he's smelly and eats tree bark, but the Bigfoot I know wouldn't let himself go like this loser. We've learned anything tonight. We've learned that Bigfoot is a winner. Bigfoot is a fighter. Don't count Bigfoot out. No, no. He's going to be back on top again. You'll see. Make no mistake about it. Paperboy just comes earlier and earlier. <coughs> earlier. <coughs> What's this? The newest edition of Monster News and Speak of the Devil, that headline? Bigfoot bears all in Boffo Broadway show. <laughs> Looks like Mr. Foots finally made the big time. 
says here that he's been cast as the lead hippie in an all-new reimagining of the Broadway stage play, Hair. Ride on, my fuzzy brown brother from another mother. Now, viewers, don't be jealous of Bigfoot's success. He's paid his dues. And if a huge, stinky monkey can swing down from the trees and become a superstar, there's still hope for the rest of us. Thank you for watching Simeon Insomnia.